So today is Friday, May 6th, and this is the Life Force Canada Agriculture Think Tank. It's about the Canadian Restoration Plan, where we're focused on Canadians growing our own food and becoming self-sufficient. We share ideas and support you in creating agriculture products, projects in your local area, such as community gardens and greenhouses. So um, thank you for being here. Yeah, Tanis, you've got some exciting things to um, to share with us. <laughs> well, we went to go see a property up the mountain from where I live. Uh -huh. And it's going to be absolutely perfect, I think, for everything that we need to do. That's on our list for our community projects all in one spot. We can even do haying or any like stuff, too. So it's got... It's got a barn, it's got a calving barn, it's got a huge shop that's full of amazing, because I'm, I'm weird, but I really love organizational, um, like shelving and hooks. I mean, just things to make it <laughs> organized. Yes. I, get, I get excited about weird things, but I do get excited about it for sure. <laughs> the house is amazing. It is, it's an older house in the 60s, but it's been well maintained it's solid as a rock it's got um a basement and the main floor is would be perfect for us to conduct our meetings and to have i don't know like council get together things and whatever and but i think it would also be good for you know having like a farm manager to live there as well yeah, I remember you talking so, about that. Because mm -hmm. someone needs to live there. You can't just leave it <laughs> vacant <laughs> overnight, I, you know. Yeah. So if we could do at least two 1,000 greenhouse, like, acre tunnels. You know, the 1,000 square foot acre tunnels. I, that's why I wasn't on the call last week is because Lizette was giving me her, the presentation of her acre tunnels. Yes, yeah. How exciting. Yeah, so yeah. it's so exciting, but uh he's he's kind of holding off for us because he's an older gentleman he's lived there since i don't know he's lived there 42 43 years so um yeah but well, he was kind of holding nice. off because he wanted um you guys to have the property is that what you're saying or he wasn't in kind of yeah yeah it was waiting he, for you and his wife wants to <laughs> his wife wants him to list it like yeah like last week but <laughs> um he's giving us an opportunity to kind of get our our poop together basically and to see what we want to do that's really cool yeah. <laughs> i love that one it's like the divine right yeah. talking right mm -hmm. well we'll see what happens but i mean you just think good thoughts and you you manifest what you want in life so we'll if it was meant to be it will be yeah yeah absolutely wonderful well thank you can i ask some questions yes absolutely to, to me so tanis is that a, your private project or is it for the life force canada like for investment some sort of more people to participate or how is it uh, and where is it that the location approximately well it's a community project yes so, so it would be owned by the council itself I guess I don't know we're looking into like a cooperative thing as well but it's um on the house mountain of White Court so it's still only like 10 minutes from White Court town so that's would be good for transporting goods to um it's still it won't cost a lot for you know when you're bringing the the vegetables or the microgreens or whatever into the restaurant because that's what we're looking at is is actually supplying for the restaurants and um, like maybe even doing like veggie boxes and stuff like that, how they do that in cities. But um, we could do something like that here too. And it wouldn't cost so much because we're not way out of town. It would only be about 10 minutes. Yeah. And it's like 78 or something. So it's like, and it's on a corner lot. So then uh, uh, the Life Force Canada yeah, uh, people should uh, whoever can invest or um, participate in buying that property or um, how does it go regarding the um, possession of that yeah that's what we're kind of trying to still figure out Katika 
So it's, there's a, there's a couple of things that we're throwing around and, you know, so it's a lot to, it's a lot to figure out. We, we haven't come to a conclusion yet. We're still just fig trying to figure out what we're going to do. Yeah. And then I get, I hope we will get um, somehow in possession of that one before someone else does it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So we'll see, like I said, we'll see what happens, you know, I don't, let's get it's some positive moving. energy there. That's right. Exactly. Um, I mean, it, the market isn't moving too fast yet anyways, because it's, I mean, we still have snow. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, again, divine right timing. <laughs> um, the uh, video that I want to share today um, is about, I think, 13 minutes long. And um, it's uh, a couple that are living on the West Coast in the Gulf Islands. And uh, so, yeah, I'll just start that and then we can talk about it. This project has taught us so much about what we value and what we enjoy doing. What I love about this journey is just feeling a new connection to the animals and to nature. Loving Off the Land is a self-challenge for ourselves that we're doing for 365 days to only eat what we catch, grow, harvest, or raise. So it's everything from raising chickens and growing our own vegetables, harvesting salt from the ocean. You know, we don't have olive oil, so we, we store our chicken fat to kind of use their cooking oil, um, stevia for sugar as a substitute. Um, we grow all of our own herbs and spices, so we haven't had anything from the store that we bought at all. We haven't had coffee we haven't enough flour to make bread so we've had no baked goods unless we can produce it or, or harvest it ourselves we haven't consumed it so yeah we're not buying anything from the store that we can consume um we do still buy hygiene products and that kind of stuff from the store but nothing that we can drink or eat is being purchased It's always been something I've wanted to do, and I've always had a garden and, and sort of grown some food. And uh, yeah, when things shut down in 2020, it just kind of put things in perspective for us with grocery stores running out of items and, and how much we rely on corporations to provide our food for us. It really kind of made us want to go for it and uh, see if we could do it and survive on our own. Chris was the main driving force behind us, and uh, the more he talked about it and the more he express his passion for it. I think um, I really saw it as just a really incredible opportunity to see if we could do it. So we are over 10 months in. So we made it through the winter, which was definitely the most challenging uh, time and got a little bit monotonous with uh, a lack of variety and things to eat. But uh, we're through that and it's mid-June now and just had six weeks to go and we've done it, which is <laughs> just kind about. of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> just about. A couple of days before our challenge began, we went through every single cupboard, every single drawer, took out anything that was um, food related or could be consumed. And then for three weeks, we gardened like crazy and tried to prepare as much as we could. We didn't start at the ideal time. It was already beginning of August. Luckily, we're in a really nice growing zone here where stuff grows through the winters. So yeah, we're doing a bunch of different uh, elements on, on how we can produce food for ourselves. So it's anything that we can catch, grow, harvest, or raise. Living on the ocean, a big part of our diet has been uh, seafood and fish and shellfish and things like that. Uh, we catch a lot of different things from the ocean that provide us with uh, a lot of our protein. So the other thing we do, obviously, is grow a lot of food here on our property. Um, so we're trying a lot of new things this year, like kiwis and lemons and have an olive tree and artichokes and um, things that we've never grown before. And we'll, we'll kind of see how they do. And then of course also have your staples that do really well here. Your kale, beets, Swiss chard, lettuces, asparagus, broccoli, cauliflower, all those sort of things that do well in the colder months as well. So um, those were kind of our staples through the winter and now trying to broaden that into some more unique things as well. Part of our challenge is that we are harvesting. Some of that harvesting comes from foraging. Things that we've foraged are um, seaweed. We've been doing a lot of blackberry. We've also um, foraged some mushrooms from the forest and learned a little bit about the kinds that we can eat and cannot eat, because <laughs> that's a big part of it. 
one of the things that we've harvested has been hazelnuts. What we'll do is we'll take the hazelnut, blend it with water, um, strain out the liquid, which turns into hazelnut milk, which is delicious. And then the pulp that comes out of it, um, that then we can turn into hazelnut flour. And then also we've been raising some chickens and turkeys, which have been a huge part of the protein that we've been consuming. Um, it's also been super eye-opening to see the whole process from start to finish, how your meat gets on the table. And um, it's, I'd say, probably been the hardest part of our challenge so far. We have six hens right now that are laying um, and they've laid really well throughout the whole winter. So they've been a really huge part of our diet. Our, our diet was very protein heavy over the winter when we were sort of lacking vegetables. So this year we have planted a lot more things, you know, growing chickpeas and growing black drying beans um, and some different things that we can sort of keep to, to become a little bit more plant based over the winter as well. So we did do a little bit of, of studying on nutrition off the bat, but to, to be perfectly honest, we kind of jumped in and rushed in. So uh, a lot of it was on the fly. And I think in a Facebook group, someone commented, what are you going to do for iodine? We went, I don't know what are you going to do for iodine? So we go, because it, it comes in table salt, normally it is added. So we didn't have that. So did some research and it's in a bunch of seaweeds. We're like, let's go get some kelp. That's now going to be in our diet. And that's how we're getting iodine. One of our staples has been wheatgrass and we'll chew on it or maybe blend it with a little bit of water and kind of take a wheatgrass shot. But then also um, we can use the uh, grains that come up, grind that into flour and we get a tiny little bit of flour. We made apple cider vinegar or apple scrap vinegar. That's our dressing, which is super tasty. Some new snacks that we've come up with lately has been, um, we've had bladderwrack dehydrated, um, kind of tastes like a chip, sort of, sort of. <laughs> it's crispy and we put salt on it, which is delicious. So these are all our crab traps and prawn traps that would normally be in the water, but we just pulled them out to do a little bit of uh, work on them and some repairs. So the crab traps normally stay out pretty much year round. Um, we'll take them out if we're going away for a period of time or sometimes we just want a break, but normally that they're sort of out there and we check them every, every day or two. So one of our new kind of sections here is hostas, which is another plant that we just found out this year is edible, which is great for us because it's a shade plant. And the majority of our property is forested. I and mean, we really didn't want to clear cut trees and cut down stuff, even though we we're trying to produce food. So um, anything we can grow in shaded areas is wonderful. So this is one of our mushroom logs, as we call it. So we just have to harvest a bunch because they were starting to curl up. but. Um, we filled the stump with mycelium and coffee grounds that we get from our local bakery here on the island who gives them to us. Um, and it's done a great job of just fruiting mushrooms for us. And these are also some logs that we have uh, inoculated with plugs. So these will hopefully be fruiting with shiitake mushrooms in the fall. Well, this is our upper forest garden, as we call it, which isn't a true forest garden, but uh, it's in our forested area that gets sort of filtered sunlight throughout the day. We just put this in this year, and we've got some things like raspberries and blueberries that do okay uh, in the acidic soil that we get from all the pine needles that uh, fall down. And uh, drawing everything from lettuce and broccoli, Brussels sprouts, bok choy, beans, uh, you name it. So we've got a whole kind of mix up here uh, to see what works. And we found some recycled drip tape that we got from one of the local farms here on the island. It's half installed now and uh, we just get to turn a tap. It helps us save water and also saves me a good 45 minutes a day, which is definitely nice too. Steph and I both really feel it's important to give back. So um, we are planting a ton of trees this year uh, as well. So we've kind of got a mix of seedlings. Some we've grown from seed and then we'll find them permanent homes in the fall. So uh, our goal is to plant 4,000 trees by the end of the year, which will help give back to, uh, to the environment that we're taking from. So this is our chicken coop. We built it at the beginning. Um, it is housing a lot of our little feathered friends. We have uh, our six original hens, as well as 10 meat chickens, some turkeys, ducks, and um, some heritage breeds as well. So this is our new garden bed that we put in just a couple of months ago. This was all lovely grass, but we find vegetables to be a little bit more useful. <laughs> we have quite the variety in here. Um, Jerusalem artichokes are at the back. And we have tons of strawberries, some yellow onions, and then lots of celery on the other side and some new tomato plants as well. 
So we have a tons of starter plants that are waiting to get planted out into the garden. Um, it's kind of our second flush of um, vegetables that will eventually go in the garden and start to produce. Tons of variety here. We planted a bunch of tomatoes because that was one of the things that we were missing the most. These are our bees. It's our first year uh, keeping bees and we're learning so much about them. Um, it's been great to see their growth and their progression um, and also they've been amazing pollinators of our garden. So we're really excited to see the difference between last year's harvest compared to this year's harvest because of the bees. So this is the first garden that we started out with. It's our lower garden. Um, it's where Chris spends most of his time. Uh, there's uh, a huge variety as well in here. A lot of it is from last winter actually, which is incredible that it uh, survived that long. But uh, yeah, one of our favorite gardens that we have here. Yeah, so we're super lucky to be in, in plant hardiness zone nine, which is uh, some Mediterranean climate. So pretty lucky to have moderate climate through the winter and, and keep a lot of things going. So if we were doing this in a, a w really winterized climate, um, we probably wouldn't have been able to do it. Having access to the ocean has been such a huge help as well. There's never been a scenario where we've been, we have nothing to eat today and we're starving. I, I definitely don't want to say it's easy, like it's it's hard and it's a lot of work, but it's it's 100% achievable in this, in this climate and where we are for sure. I think we're definitely delved into the self-sufficiency path for sure. You know, there's still things that we want to do. We want to provide more of our own grains for our chickens and things like water are a big issue on the island. So can we start capturing more rainwater over the winter to water everything, which takes a lot in the summer and going solar eventually is something we're looking at. The next year and the next two years will be really interesting in how far we come on our self-sufficiency journey. We've definitely saved money not eating out and not drinking and, <laughs> and buying anything, but it hasn't been as much as you would think, I think, with the infrastructure. Obviously, being our first year, a lot went into building garden beds and building chicken coops and, and getting things started. But next year, I think we're going to see a huge amount of savings. We were sort of both out of work at the time uh, when we first started. So for the first four months, uh, we were able to put sort of full time into the infrastructure and, and what we were doing. But uh, we've both been back to work now since since January to manage to, to do what we're doing while managing jobs, uh, both of us. It's amazing how much garbage and waste and recycling comes from our food and beverage products, which we never really thought about before. And the first three months, we kind of, at the end of it, we're sitting there and be like, we only have two small bags of garbage that we produce in three months and normally produce at least one a week of those, I would say, yeah. if, not, if not more. So it's, that's been another beneficial thing that I think we'll focus on and take into consideration a lot more. Definitely not everything's worked and we've had our sort of challenges as well. And uh, um, we've tried things like making maple syrup from trees, which we were out there checking every morning and be like, do we get any drip of sap? And we're like, nope, we got nothing. And I think we had idyllic plans of making sunflower oil at the beginning of the season from sunflower <laughs> seeds and put them downstairs and forgot about them for a little too long and they got moldy. So then that went out the window. So it's definitely had some, some failures and some challenges. So we've uh, sort of made this public and, and been sharing it with people. So uh, we do weekly videos on YouTube of our trials and tribulations and what's worked and what hasn't and what's been our challenges. So I think for a number of reasons, obviously, but one of them I think was just to hold ourselves accountable. So uh, yeah, Loving Off the Land is, is the YouTube channel. We're loving the lifestyle and loving what we're doing. So we'll keep going for sure. Won't be quite as strict and we'll start introducing a few things and enjoy a meal out once in a while and uh, probably have a new challenge in the work as well. I think we've really fallen in love with what we're doing and it's created a sense of purpose almost. We have to get up in the morning to feed the chickens and to care for our vegetable gardens and I think it's just such a rewarding process from start to finish. Yeah. For those of you that came in late, um, this particular video is a couple that um, living in the Gulf Islands of BC. And um, as they had shared, they, um, there's four components of planting, growing, raising. Anyway, yeah, they don't eat anything that they don't produce themselves. So I thought you might find that interesting. I will post the, um, the link to their YouTube channel in uh, Telegram. Anyway, again, welcome the other people that came in late. The other thing I wanted to throw out to you is there a lot of the think tanks are switching to um, every two weeks. I'm not sure if this is just going to be during the summer or permanently. And wanted to know what you would like to do um, 
This is the first Friday in May. So what are your preferences? What if we just try that and see how we like it? Because, you know, when you're not doing something, you, you kind of fall away from it. That's yes. the only issue that I that I could see happening. I, uh, rare, um, I cannot attend uh, each Friday. Rarely I can because I usually I'm doing the both jobs in the morning and afternoon. So today I didn't have booked clients later, so I was able to come. So depends. My schedule is kind of variable. <laughs> Yeah, and of course, um, Karen's been posting the uh, replays on uh, YouTube. So if you do miss them, you would be able to um, watch them there. Uh, I just want to say uh, I don't have any preference. I'm at work all day. So anytime the meetings are, uh, I try to my best to participate. <laughs> so I'm at work all the time. <laughs> okay, well, I guess um, <laughs> we'll figure that out then. And uh, there is going to be any changes if it's going to be every second week then we'll be sure to post that in uh in telegram and uh yeah katika you've got your your hand up yeah uh yes at uh, yesterday's uh an energy alternative meeting uh Dwayne said that um uh, the idea about uh bi-weekly uh, meetings is that um that people then have more times for gardening for other stuff mm -hmm. so that's the reason, yeah, outdoor activities and yeah, we are more doing some other things. So that's why. Okay. And as I said, we'll probably have uh, just a short meeting today. We'll end before the top of the hour. So anyone else have anything um, before we close that you'd like to talk about? My plan for the next meeting that is that we would talk about the uh, foraging and uh, wild crafting. So um, that'll be our topic for the next meeting. Lucy, you've got your hand up and Katika. Yeah, I was just going to say for me, two weeks works better because I'm finding, yes, with the summer, it's, uh, it's you know what, I think every week is going to be a little bit too hard, but uh, that's just me. Great. Thank that you. That I yield. Appreciate that. Katika? Um, just one short information. I posted that in some uh, on, on my chat on Telegram, uh, that information, and elsewhere in a couple other groups. Uh, uh, on Saturday, tomorrow, there is an event uh, in Calgary, whoever is in Calgary or around. Uh, it's um, called Escape uh, Canada. Uh, there are information about um, options to travel with these uh, federal mandates regarding travel, too. So whoever is interested in, in this information, I posted that in several groups there. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's what I wanted to say. Great, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, Kai, go ahead. Since I'm kind of new to all this and participating in the think tanks, I, I'd just like to, if you could just kind of share um, what uh, what we're doing with the think tank and what, how, uh, how it's kind of growing in that direction and kind of what that looks like because you know as I'm kind of running the Calgary plan council uh, uh, meetings and everything here I guess the main thing and the sense of urgency is that comes up is creating food security and uh, what that looks like so those are the that's kind of what we're exploring here so I come here to kind of see what ideas and everything evolve or what to bring back to the community so I, I just like to get, uh, kind of hear from you guys kind of what does that look like or what's evolving here? <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly that. We um, are bringing up topics and sharing ideas that, that do revolve around the uh, food and water security, just as you're doing in your uh, Plan Council Calgary. So, um, and of course, sharing ideas for projects and, uh, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah you're in uh, <laughs> the right place for for um having you know like-minded people who um are discussing these topics and actively involved in um in the different projects so does that help we, we don't yeah want i just wanted to get some clarity on on kind of what it was because i just see every week i, I hear i see different ideas kind of different things kind of pop up and i just kind of want to get a better picture of what it was <laughs> Yeah, and that's where, uh, again, um, we want you to share your ideas or bring forward uh, topics for the different uh, agriculture think tanks that you'd like us to cover. Um, or if you come across a, a great video or something that you think would be helpful for the group to um, watch and discuss, that would be great. Um, so yeah, we're totally open to ideas. 
And like I said, uh, at the next meeting, so I guess if we're gonna go two weeks, that'll be on the 20th, the long weekend. And um, I will post that up in the Telegram group and we'll be talking about uh, foraging and wildcrafting, so. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad that you'll be recording that then, Karen. Yeah. Um, because that is something I was actually supposed to do this weekend too, is on, go on this um, foraging kind of course, but we still have so much snow here <laughs> that um, I'll, I'll go to another one. But anyways, um, I had my hand up because I wanted to thank you for, for, um, for sending, like for sharing that video today, because I think that's something that we need to look at. Um, like every, every region will be different, obviously, like up north here will be a lot different from people down in Calgary, uh, especially with a lot, you know, higher uh, growing season. <laughs> but what, what I was really um, wondering about when I was watching that, when I was watching that video is how, how would I do this here, you know, live, loving off the land, <laughs> you know, in the great white north, you know, because we don't have an ocean, <laughs> you know, and I was also thinking these two must be like going to be the most healthiest people on earth <laughs> because they're not having any sugar products, no preservatives, like, you know, <laughs> but um, so, and another thing too is like, how do I feed my animals? Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I, that's one thing I really want to focus on too, is like, so right now I buy chicken feed, you know, right now I buy dog food right now I buy cat food. So what do I do when there is nothing to buy? I think that's something that we need to consider if anybody has animals of what is the, what is the options out there? Like, obviously we could, you know, we could kill wildlife and feed the dogs or whatever, but <laughs> what am I going to feed my chickens in the winter? You know? Yeah, so I'm glad you brought that this up. This is something that's the only. <clears throat> I will put that on my list so that we make sure that we cover that on um, one of our think tanks. So yeah, um, I thought it was interesting in the video when they showed their fridge. Um, <laughs> you notice their fridge didn't have a whole lot of stuff in it, so that was interesting too. I I totally agree too. I kind of I think my mouth dropped a little bit because of the vast difference between that fridge and my fridge. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah yeah I, I just want to share a topic that you know that maybe we can consider in the future because I'm like because we live in colder climates but you also see around the world you know food preservation and fermentation is is an art and a craft that you know we can utilize uh, when there is no produce or food during growing season and everything here that we can utilize to get ourselves through winter Great, Kai. Yes, that's one thing we didn't have on our list. So um, I will add that as well. I like that. We, we, uh, it'd be great if we, we cover that one. So thank but you. Lots of, different, lots of different types of food preservation is what you're asking, Kai? Yeah, and, and just to kind of introduce the concept, you know, it's, it's kind of a lost art, like, you know, uh, my generation really doesn't know how to really kind of pickle or ferment kind of stuff. I know that's just kind of like from my grandparents day and, day and age is what they did all the time, right? So you always had something during the seasons when it didn't grow, you know? Right. And, and, and I know my, my mom canned absolutely everything on our farm, absolutely everything. So I know what you're saying, Kai. <laughs> my mom did it, but... I mean, I guess, I guess I could do it, but I would really need a refresher. <laughs> what I'll do is I'll post uh, in the Telegram group the um, all the different topics. When, like we had created um, a list a few weeks back. So I'll post that list on there so that it'll get you thinking about, okay, what, what's missing? What else would uh, we like added to, uh, added to that list of topics? So thank you. Well, I guess, as I said, we're going to um, end a little bit early today. Again, thank you for being here. Um, Karen or Dwayne will be posting um, the recording up on the uh, YouTube channel. And um, yeah, and then I'll post updates about the, uh, the next think tank in the Telegram group as well. The update for the Zoom link is corrupted corrected on the Life Force Canada think tank page. So thank you again, everyone for being here and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.